Thank you guys. Tell them thank you. Yeah. They told you how to give. I'll just remind you, there's lots of ways to give. You can give your time. You can give some resources. You can give some money. We talked about giving the last few weeks, didn't we? We talked about living a life of generosity and how there are at least seven ways that we can be generous, and six of them have nothing to do with our money. And you can give in all those capacities to Camp Big Cedars. Thank you, Robert and Paula, for your efforts, for your heart, for your consistency, for your faithfulness, for your dedication, and for your commitment to the young people of Oklahoma, especially through the years. We appreciate you very much. I uh, kicked around the idea of just kicking us out of here, but I really feel uh, like the Lord wants me to share uh, with you today. I, I, I Typically, you know, I've been getting you out around 1130, but I really feel like I need to share this message with you today. It's a, it's a new series. Um, we've talked about the generous life the last few weeks. We're going to kick off a new series today called Win the Day. Win the Day. If you want to change your life, you have to change your story. If you want to change your life, you have to change your story. Sir William Osler delivered a speech at Yale University, and in it was a simple message. I'll give you the Cliff's Note version of the speech. Four words. Live in daytight compartments. And I know one of those is a compound word, so those of you that are English majors or persnickety, you got that. Live in daytight compartments. That's easier said than done, but if you can pull it off, you can put it in practice. And it's a solution to a thousand problems. According to psychologists Matthew Killingsworth and Daniel Gilbert, the average person spends 46.9% of their time thinking about something other than what they're presently doing in the present moment. In other words... We spend most of our time, or a majority of our time, or almost a majority of our time, living in a time zone that we're not occupying. We're depressed about the past. We're worried about the future. We're distracted by things going on around us. We're frustrated. We're overwhelmed. And by this and that and the other thing, all of this stuff compounds to where we're half present half of the time. Which means that we're only half alive. Because we're not committed to whatever it is that we're engaged in actively. And the only way to be fully alive is to be fully present. And the only way to be fully present is, you may have guessed, to live in daytight compartments. This is not just a good idea. This is a God idea. Scripture talks about, give us this day our daily bread. Take up your cross Daily. This is the day the Lord has made. His mercies are new every morning. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't worry about tomorrow. And here's the bottom line. Yesterday is history and tomorrow is a, is a mystery. And our job is to win the day. To win today. Now I have no idea what goal you're going after or what problem you're trying to solve or what difficulty you're trying to overcome or what habit you're trying to break or habit you're trying to build. But I do know that there's a secret to the success. And it's going to happen one day at a time. You have to win the day. You don't win tomorrow and you don't win yesterday. You have to win the day. And then you have to get up and you have to do it the next day. And then you get up and do it the next day. And then you do it two days in a row and it's called a winning streak. It's also called sanctification. And here's what we're going to do over the next seven weeks. Actually, it's going to be nine weeks. I'll explain that later. But we have a few other things that are factoring into this series. But we're going to unpack seven habits. Seven habits that will help you stress less and accomplish more. Here are the titles to the seven messages. Flip the script, kiss the wave, eat the frog, fly the kite, cut the rope, wind the clock, and seed the clouds. Y'all are excited, I can tell. 
So let me plant a seed of faith right here. Almost anyone can accomplish anything if they work at it long enough and hard enough and smart enough. You are capable of more than you can imagine. And how can you do this? Because God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or all that we think or all that we imagine. But with that said, 75% of New Year's resolutions fail within the first month. Why? When you think in one-year timelines, it's overwhelming. You remember that, that statement Dr. Osler said? Think in day-tight compartments. Live in day-tight compartments. You feel like quitting before you even start when you're planning a whole year. So here's a question. What can keep you coming back again and again and again? Pick a habit, any habit. Can you do it for a day? Can, can you do it for a day? You have to take your life goals, your plans, your vision, and reverse engineer them into daily habits. And here's the good news. The only ceiling on your intimacy with God and your impact in the world is your spiritual disciplines. If you meet with God every day, He's going to show up every day. And He's going to show off every day in your life. If you have a Bible, you could meet with me in Genesis 50 and verse 20. But before we zoom in, we're going to zoom out. We're going to look at that scripture in a few minutes. But before we do, I want us to, to zoom out and take a, a high-level view. Vladimir Lenin, anybody remember that name? Bit of a sinister individual. He said, there are decades when nothing happens, and there are weeks when decades happen. Let me push this envelope a little and up the, enemy, the, the ante. There are days when decades happen. Having said that, let me say this. You can't just flip the calendar and expect everything to change. You have to flip the script. And the first habit in flipping the script is winning the day. And here's the big idea. If you want to change your life, you have to change your story. In the science of cybernetics, there are two kinds of change. There's first-order change, which is behavioral. It's about doing something more or something less. If you're trying to lose weight, you eat less and exercise more. Those are steps in the right direction. First-order change can facilitate a quick fix. But second-order change passes the test of time. Second-order change is conceptual. Conceptual is mind over matter. That's where the magic happens. It's, it's where everything is created twice. The first creation is a mental image. It's an internal expression. And then the second creation is physical. It's an external animation of what's already being created on the inside. Everything that was once a thought is now something that we are doing. You don't just bear the image of God, you are His idea. You are His workmanship. You are a unique expression of God's imagination. He saw you before you were created in your mother's womb. He formed you. He conceptualized you. He imagined you. He created you uniquely. He created you with an individual purpose. There never has been and there never will be anyone like you. Not a testament to you, a testament to God who created you. And the significance is this, no one can worship God like you or for you. No one can serve God like you or for you. We tend to think of habits as external exercises that increase our proficiency and productivity, and that's true. But it's really about practicing scales. It's about practicing skills. It's the external habits that pay dividends, no doubt. But the biggest return on investment, what I would call the high leverage habits, are the internal ones. The ones that no one sees. The internal monologue. It's the way that you explain your experiences to yourself. It's the stories you tell yourself day in and day out. Science tells us that we have about 60,000 thoughts that fire across our synapses every single day. According to a study done by Cleveland Clinic, about 80% of those thoughts are negative. 
I'd say, Houston, we have a problem. The problem is our stinking thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, Proverbs says, so is he. Your thoughts have a psychological and physiological impact on your life. Your thoughts have power to lower your blood pressure, slow your pulse, boost your immunity, or they have the power to do the exact opposite. And the battle is won or lost in our minds. The stories you tell yourself are far more important than the situations you find yourself in. That's when and where we flip the script. I'm going to say that again. The stories you tell yourself are far more important than the situations you find yourself in. So with this backdrop, Genesis 50-20, let me set the scene. Joseph is a teenager. He has a dream, a dream that his brothers would one day bow down to him. He makes his dream known to his brothers and his family. They fake his death. They sell him into slavery. Life goes from bad to worse. He ends up in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And if anybody could have played the victim card, it's Joseph. But this isn't how he narrates his story to himself. Long story short, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh puts a signet ring on Joseph's finger and makes him second in command. Thirteen years after selling him into slavery, his brothers come knocking on his door begging for food because of a famine. In Genesis 43, 28, it says his brothers bow down before him. Now I can only imagine what Joseph must have thought must have felt. It's a day when decades happen. The vision he had at 17, the vision that went off the rails, the vision that took a wrong turn, the vision that seemed so far away, the vision that doesn't seem possible now is fulfilled in an instant. This is the day when decades happen. All right, chapter 50, verse 20. It's like a time-lapse video. Joseph looks back at all the ups and downs, all the pain, all the suffering, all the struggle, all the twists, all the turns. And he says, you intended to harm me. But God, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. May God give us a Genesis 50-20 vision let me make this simple as one, two, three. If you're going to flip the script, you have to get three things, and you've got to get them right. You have to know your name, you have to fix your focus, and you have to change your story. First thing, you have to know your name. More than a century ago, Charles Horton Cooley founded the American Sociological Association, and he said, I am not what I think I am, and I am not what you think I am. I am what I think I am you think I am. A little bit of a tongue twister, mind bender, but I bet it sounds vaguely familiar because Cooley called it the looking glass of self, and it's a basing of our sense of self on how we believe others see us. Our sense of self comes a lot from what other people think, and it comes from many different resources, but sometimes it's as simple as someone saying, you're good at this and you're bad at that. Either way, It's letting other people narrate our story. It's living your life according to their expectations. So it's critical for us to take cues from Scripture. From Scripture. Scripture is our script cure. The book of James likens the Bible to a miracle. It it is the place where we discover who we are in the eyes of God. This is how we know our name. This is where we gain our identity. This is how we flip the script. Let me dive back into Joseph's story right right quick. After playing a few mind games with his brothers, which I totally feel were justified, by the way. He was entitled to that at the very least. He finally reveals his identity in Genesis 45, verse 3. He says, I am Joseph. And you know what's interesting about this verse of Scripture? is that in most cases, whenever you've read that story, if you've read that story very many times, you read right past what he says. But Joseph knows his name. You're probably thinking, well, of course he knows his name. It's his name. Well, not so fast. Fun fact, Daily Double, if you know this. When Pharaoh makes Joseph second in command, he doesn't give him a signet ring and say, here you go, Joseph. He gives him an Egyptian name, 
Zaphonath Panea. That's how he's known throughout the entire kingdom of Egypt. He's known as Zaphonath Panea. And it would have been easy for Joseph to forget his name. It would have been easy for him to forget who he was. And if you allow it, culture will name you. It will tame you. It will label you. It will define you. Cancer culture will will chew you up and spit you out. You have to know who you are. You have to know whose you are. You need to know your name. You are blessed, you are chosen, you are blameless, you are adopted by the Father, you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, you are stamped with the image of God. Simply put, you are who God says you are. And if you want to flip the script, you need to know your name. Second thing, you have to fix your focus. I have a saying I try to model. I'm trying to teach. I've tried to teach this. To all of our kids, I don't necessarily say the saying all the time. But the saying is this, your focus determines your reality. That's what Qui-Gong said to Luke Skywalker, by the way. (laughs) But this is more than a Jedi mind trick. This is Philippians chapter 4. Whatsoever things are right, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are admirable, think about these things. Why? Your focus determines your reality. If you're going to look for an excuse, you will always find an excuse. If you're going to look for something to be grateful for, you'll always find something to be grateful for. Where you focus is what you will become. There's a concept in psychology. Pastor Joel could speak to this at length, I'm confident. But it's called cognitive reappraisal. It's about telling yourself a different story about what is happening. Joseph is exhibit A as an illustration of cognitive reappraisal. He could have played the victim card and played it well, right? He also could have played God and even the score with his brothers. But he didn't do either thing. Why? Because he got a God's eye view of the situation. Dr. Martin Seligman, the former president of the APA, said that all of us have what he calls an explanatory style. Explanatory style is the manner in which you habitually explain yourself or explain to yourself why events happen. It's those explanations, not the experiences themselves, that make us or break us. What's Joseph's explanatory style? Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but that's not where I'm going to focus my energy. God intended it for good. The saving of many lives. There's a meme that circulated on social media for the last year about the end of 2020 and about it being a dumpster fire. It was pretty funny and whatnot, but that's the wrong explanation. It was a refiner's fire. And what comes out of a refiner's fire is always pure. It's always more precious. It's always more valuable. Why? Because it's been refined by the touch of the master's hand. The prophet Malachi asked the question, who is able to endure? Who is able to stand? He will be like a blazing fire that refines metal. Like a strong soap that bleaches the clothes. He will sit it like a refiner of silver burning away all the dross. How do we fix our focus? The short answer is fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. He looked down through history and He saw you and your name was joy. Your name was worth it. I love this moment when Peter gets out of the boat in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night, By the way, that takes a ton of faith to do. But here's the deal. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. But here's what happens. He gets out of the boat, and because he's focused on Jesus, he walks on water, right? But then, he got distracted. His focus wasn't fixed on Jesus. He lost focus. 
And he started focusing on the wind and the waves. And that's when he started to sink. So I'm going to give you a couple of easy applications here to help you to keep your focus in the right place. One, keep a gratitude journal. One of the simplest ways to fix your focus is to keep a gratitude journal. It will sanctify your your activating system of your brain. The part of the brain that determines what we notice and what goes unnoticed. It will highlight and emphasize the things that are of value. It will help you tell yourself the right story about your circumstance. It will help you to get a God's eye view. Secondly, change of pace plus change of place equals change of perspective. The key to spiritual growth is routine. But once the routine becomes routine, you have to change the routine. It's called the law of requisite variety. Every year I download a a new Bible reading plan. Thanks to my friends at YouVersion. But I also change translations. Why? Because it makes the synapses fire a different way in my brain. It causes me to look at things differently. Last year I, I read the New Living Translation. This year I'm reading the New English Version. Which I absolutely love, by the way. Lots of ways to put this into practice. The third thing, read old books. If you want new ideas, Ivan Pavlov said, read old books. I love biographies. They help me. They help me see life from a different perspective. They help me identify things about me that I didn't understand even existed. That said, no book is older than the Bible. No book is more interesting than the Bible. It gives us a God's eye view. It reminds us of the meta-narrative. The Jewish theologian Abraham Herschel said that prophecy is the exegesis of existence from a divine perspective. Exegesis of existence. Exegesis means the breaking down and the dismantling and the understanding of why something is the way it is or why it means what it means. He also said, in decisive hours of histories of history, it dawns upon us that we would not trade certain lines in the book of Isaiah for the seven wonders of the world. Think of some of the lines from Isaiah, Fear thou not, neither be thou dismayed. I am thy God, yea, I will uphold thee. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. I'm not sure that Herschel was referencing the seven wonders of the world, of the ancient world, or the seven wonders of the natural world. But either way, he's saying that during times of crisis, we need to get a word from God, a word from Scripture. Scripture is our plumb line. Scripture is our anchor line. Scripture is our lifeline. And that brings us to our third point. You have to change your story. According to a study done by Emory University, the best predictor of a child's emotional well-being is not getting them into a great school. It's not giving them lots of hugs and kisses. It's not letting them get away with everything. It's not letting them get, get their way every time. It's not taking them on a pilgrimage to Disney World every, every year. It's not allowing them to watch Pixar films. According to the research done by Emory University, the number one indicator of the emotional well-being of a child, drumroll please, is a child knowing their family history. Huh? Here's what I know for sure. All of us are born into someone else's story. When Danielle and I had kids, we had talked beforehand. We made the decision that they were joining our life. We weren't joining theirs. They were coming to be a part of our lives. They were going to go where we went. They were going to do what we did. They were going to learn to participate and appreciate and respect and and accept all the things that we engaged in. That they weren't going to dictate policy and plans, but we were going to dictate policy and plans. And it's still that way today to the largest extent. I know Jaden and Jaron are probably thinking, well, Dason, he, he, <laughs> he is the baby, right? Yeah. 
But he got up yesterday morning at 6 a.m., well, actually at 5.15 a.m., and had a 6 o'clock workout on a Saturday. And he didn't complain. I made that plan. He didn't make that plan. If he'd have been asked to make that plan, he would have declined that plan. But I made that plan, and he participated. That's the point. The point is that they were born into our story, and I was born into my parents' story. She was born into her parents' story. We all have a family of origin. That's our genesis. Our children are born into our story. For better or for worse, all of us are born into someone else's story. And here's the good news. As children of God, when we are grafted into God's family, we get grafted into His story. And this is huge because Scripture becomes our script. The book is our backstory. And our lives become the rest of the story. Whenever you're grafted into the gospel message and you're grafted into the family of God, you become the fifth gospel. You become Acts chapter 29. There is no Acts chapter 29. You become Revelation chapter 23. There is no Revelation chapter 23. You are the only Bible some people will ever read. The question is, is your life a good translation? Here's how it works. You surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus. And you can do that at any time, by the way. At church camp. Or in a church service, or driving down the road, or sitting on an airplane, or kneeling beside your bed. And you give the author and perfecter of your faith complete editorial control. And he begins writing the story, writing his story in you and through you. In Judaism, those who follow a rabbi had four responsibilities. Four responsibilities. First, they would memorize his words. That's where we get the Gospels from, by the way. Memorize his words. The second responsibility was adopting his interpretation of Scripture. The third is called the rabbi's yoke. Excuse me, that's the second adopting his translation of Scripture. It's called the rabbi's yoke. We would say the Sermon on the Mount. The third is imitating the rabbi's way of life. I'll come back to that in a moment. And the fourth is discipling others the way you were discipled. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Let's go back to that third one. The third responsibility, imitating Imitating is one key to habit formation. There's a form of acting called method acting. It involves taking extreme measures to get into a character. The things of legends of Hollywood. Dustin Hoffman went three days without sleep to prep for a scene in Marathon Man. Meryl Streep learned Polish and German for Sophie's Choice. Christian Bale lost 60 pounds to play an emaciated insomniac. Jamie Foxx glued his eyes shut to play Ray Charles. Leonardo DiCaprio slept inside of an animal carcass before filming Revenant. Discipleship is method acting. It's about taking cues from Jesus. We love like Jesus. We think like Jesus. We pray like Jesus. We treat people like Jesus. Do that long enough and you become like Jesus, which is the ultimate goal of discipleship, to be just like Jesus. I have a simple theory of spiritual maturity. When you first encounter a verse of Scripture, it's nothing more than theory. You have to test the theory. How? By putting it in practice. Then that theory becomes your testimony. Maturity is testing God's Word. Maturity is that theory becoming your testimony. I'll give you an example. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Matthew 16, 19. 
We've been given tremendous authority as followers of Jesus, but we have to exercise it. We have to believe it. We have to animate it. We have to express it. Now, I want to be careful here because every prayer has to pass a twofold litmus test. One, it has to be the will of God, and two, it has to bring glory to God. Anything less, anything else is a non starter. God isn't a genie in a bottle, and our wish is not His command. So praying silly prayers is not what I'm talking about. Prayer isn't outlining our agenda to God. Prayer is about getting into God's Word and God's presence and letting Him outline His agenda to us. Remember the signet ring that Pharaoh gave Joseph? It gave him full authority. We have the full backing of the King of Kings and His kingdom. We have to operate in that authority. We have to exercise that authority. We have the authority to rebuke the wind and the waves and demons and devils. We have the authority to bind things on earth. This is our script. We are method actors. The theory becomes a reality, and when it does, it becomes our testimony. And our testimony is prophetic. If God did it before, He can do it again. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is history. Let's flip the script and win the day for His glory. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank You. Thank you for the challenge that comes from your word. Thank you for the anointing that comes from your spirit. Lord, make our hearts hunger for the sweetness of the truth of Scripture. Help our mouths to desire the honeycomb, the sweet honey that comes from Scripture that we might know You, that we might understand Your story, that the theory on the page would become the testimony in our hearts and of our lives. That we would become animators and expressors of the truth of Your kingdom. And that we would live our lives and walk out our lives effectually before You. That we would flip the script. That we would tell ourselves the truth of what your word declares over the facts of our circumstance, of our culture, and of our world. Just ask you real quickly before we go here today, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need God's help in this area. I need to flip the script in my mind so that I can flip the script in my life. And I need God's help. Please pray for me today. You that are watching online, send us a message. We'll pray for you. We'll pray with you. We'll agree with you for God to help you. But if you need prayer today, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need God's help to flip the script in my mind to think the right way about what God has said about my life. Real quickly, would you let me know who you are? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Several of us. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help us. Help us. We cry out to you, God. We cry out to you. We need your help, Lord. We we can't do this thing on our own. Help us to stop being overwhelmed by the task at hand and just be focused upon the moment that we're in. Help us to learn to live in daytight compartments. Help us to learn that life may have been tough, life may have been bad for decades, but decades can come to pass in a day. 
You can flip the script. You can change our direction. You can cause things to occur in ways that we never even dreamt or imagined. And we pray that you do that now. Lord, you see our hands. You know our hearts. You know our lives. You know our struggles. You know our fears. You know our pain. Help us to overcome that we might live lives that bring you glory. Go with us now. Cause us to walk uprightly before you in a way that brings you glory and pleasure. Help us to not stumble and fall. Help us to glorify Jesus in all that we say and do. We ask this in the name that's above every name, for his sake and for his glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a fantastic Sunday afternoon. If you'd like to give to Camp Big Cedars, you can give something to Robert and Paula. You can drop it in the offering basket in the back. You can give it online. You can hand it to us. There's a lot of ways you can get resources. And if you want to help, uh, get with them on some of the projects maybe that uh, need to be done, need to be accomplished, and I'm sure they can give you lots of information. Any questions, they'll be around here uh, for a little bit. If you have questions, catch up to them. Lord bless you. We love you. Have a great week. You're dismissed.